we're live. Oh, good. We send, uh, okay. take it away. Yeah. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Yang Wang. Dr. Yang is, uh, is a senior computational scientist at the Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center. And he's an adjunct faculty in the Department of Physics at Duquesne University. His research interests include developing linear scaling quantum mechanical simulation codes to study uh, the electronic and magnetic structures of metals and alloys. Uh, also, Dr. Wang is interested in applying parallel supercomputing technology to alloy modeling and design. With this, I welcome you and please go ahead. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Uh, okay, now this is the challenging part. Okay, we'll see. Let me see. Okay, super easy. Tell me if I have... Yes, this is working. I can see it fine. Okay, good. Uh, all right. Uh, by the way, uh, super computing center, not super computer. It's a, there's a quite a big difference. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm glad you're right. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, is uh, ab initio electronic structure calculations at the dawn of exascale computing. If you ever wonder what exa really means is that, uh, let me, uh, okay, here you go. Okay, so according to Wikipedia about this unit prefix, uh, we actually all derived from uh, Greek words, like a terra is from tetra, 10 to the fourth, uh, thousand fourth power. And what's seen at a terra scale uh, period of time, uh, like uh, 20 years ago. And now we are in the uh, era of a peta scale, which is thousand fifth power. Uh, of course, the next thing we're gonna see is really uh, exa and zeta and uh, yota. So you know what's gonna come out. Uh, so kind of their standard uh, uh, use of this uh, SI, uh, uh, this units. Uh, but at the moment, we are certainly in the petascale uh, time period. So the, this is the latest uh, list of the uh, fastest supercomputer in the world. Then rank number one right now is uh, uh, Japan's uh, uh, Riken Centers uh, for Computational Science. Uh, this is a supercomputer Fugaku, uh, which is now is uh, 500, more than 500 petaflops. And the, sec uh, sec uh, the second uh, machine on the list is uh, Summit. Uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab. It's also in the range of uh, more than 200 uh, petaflops. So we are certainly in a, a petascale uh, time, but certainly we'll see the end of the, the, this period because we're ex we we next year we're expecting to see Frontier Machine, which is an exascale machine, uh, in, will be available at Oak Ridge National Lab together with Aurora at Argonne National Lab. Um, so that will be the uh, 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 America's first exascale system to help guide the uh, researchers to uh, new discoveries at the uh, exascale. Okay, so now the question is, how can we take advantage of this kind of uh, supercomputing power to advance our understanding of the uh, material science and uh, to develop a better uh, computational uh, uh, methodologies uh, for our uh, for for submitting uh, larger uh, more complex uh, structures. So for the outline of the talk, I'm going to give a brief overview of the Abelisio electronic structure calculations, and in particular, I'm going to talk about green function approach, uh, because that this uh, method really shows a promise for the uh, uh, high performance. I'm going to show the the performance we we achieved right now, and that we're going to look forward to the to the future at the scale computing time. So what I'm going to talk about in particular, the application of order structures. Uh, uh, then more challenging part is the disordered structures, how we take our approach. In particular, I'm going to talk about KKRCPA method and also the LSMS method. And uh, it's, a, it's a super sale method, super sale approach. And also I will, I will look forward, we're going to, uh, I'm going to talk about this LSMS with embedding. That's uh, the kind of future uh, the kind of work we're going to do. And I will show the petascale performance of this LS MS method because this is a really linear scaling method. Uh, that's why it has like a, can achieve this petascale performance. And finally, I'll give a, a summary. Uh, in case some of you are not familiar with the uh, 
kind of approach we take, uh, the quantum mechanical approach to solid state materials. We all know that materials are made of nucleus and electron. And this is a really many electron problem. It's obviously not, uh, it's impossible to solve if, for this kind of uh, problem. So for, uh, then because of the interaction between electrons, electron uh, nuclear interactions, and this is kind of really many electron Schrodinger equation if you want to try to uh, write down the quantum mechanical equations. Uh, it's fortunate because uh, Walter Cohn's work in 1960s, uh, we have a density functional theory that reduced this kind of problem into this one electron problem that this one electron is like uh, swimming in a kind of swamp described as this, uh, uh, this kind of potential called effective potential that really uh, includes all the quantum mechanical effect of many, many body effects into this, uh, this uh, effective uh, 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 potential. Then we have this uh, uh, one electron uh, called Kongshan equation we need to solve. So our goal is to find this row, this electron density, which can be constructed in this way so that Kongshan equation is satisfied. Okay, that's essentially the, 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 the kind of many electron problem can be reduced to this one electron problem. So all different methods are trying to, different additional methods are trying to solve this uh, equation uh, more efficiently and uh, to, uh, so to construct electron density, this solution for that is called the Kongshan orbital. Now, uh, this is one particular type of approach to that is called a Green's function approach. The simplest form of Green's function is by the construction of the Green's function is this: that on the right-hand side is the summation of the, all the, uh, uh, eigen, the eigenvalues of the Kongshan equation, and this is a, this is just uh, this Kongshan orbitals, and uh, then. You don't need the green function. I'm gonna take the imaginary part of it and, and we get the electron density. Okay, that's one way to do that. Uh, and then this is a this is a, this psi uh, this function is a block wave or, or a Kongshan orbital, and this is the epsilon sub alpha is just a band structures. But this is kind of useless because if we know this uh, uh, block wave, why do we bother to calculate green function? We can use block wave. We can calculate electron density directly without going through this, right? So this is essentially a uh, uh, useless. Another thing is, this we have to, in order to calculate a green function, we have to sum over the band structure all over to, to the infinity. That in principle, that's only that's true for the green function. So this is essentially uh, useless. So why we bother the green function? But there's another uh, expression that is based on multiple scattering theory. Actually, we can derive another uh, 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 expression for the green function. It's given by this. So this tau represents the scattering of the electron being scattered by uh, different atoms. Uh, so if the for for if you ask the uh, electron density near a particular given atom, all you have to do is find the multiple scattering uh, uh, scattering matrix tau, and solve the single side the single uh, scattering problem, uh, z which is a regular solution and j is called irregular solution. You just solve that, and you can calculate Green's function this way. So uh, where the tau is given by because this is a multiple scattering problem as a whole represents the uh, property of the entire crystal. So what you have to, to do is you find the sc single scattering matrix called T matrix for the, all the atoms in the space and put it in the diagonal blocks. And the off diagonal block uh, just kind of construct constant matrix. Uh, so I'm not going to go into detail that. Uh, it just tell, it's only re relevant to the position of the atoms. You can construct that way, it gets the tall matrix. So it's kind of, uh, you can easily calculate it. Uh, in particular, if your system happens to be periodic, that is, all these T matrices are the same because they are all same atom. So if happen to be have, have a crystal, then you can this calculation can be reduced to a, a case space integration. So you can calculate it this way. Uh, so by doing the case space integration, you get tau matrix and you can calculate Green's function this way uh, without going through solving this uh, Kongshan equation and band structure. So you can calculate Green's function. So then you can calculate charge density and the density states. Okay, so essentially this kind of approach allowed an, not to really calculate band structure and the block wave functions. So we are not, don't have to worry about the normalization and the organization of the block waves. Uh, so this kind of approach is also is called a multiple scattering theory, also called KKR method. Sometimes it's called a green function approach. So it's all different names, all mean the same thing. So this is the kind of approach we take. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, without going into details of the um, um, expanding multiple scattering theory, so I just show some kind of result. This is for the simple 
a, a metal calculation. Uh, so I have a list of the uh, result for uh, a molybdenum that uh, shows the uh, uh, equilibrium lattice constant, bulk modules, and other mechanical uh, uh, quantities. They can compare with a VN2K, EMTO, VASP, all the different, uh, uh, different electrical cal calculation methods and uh, compare with the experiment. And this is some subtle difference between MST with other, like VN2K and a VASP result. The, the difference is caused by the fact that we treat the core electrons differently in the VN2K and the VAS, the 4S and 4P electrons are treated as uh, valence. But in the MST and the EMTO method, they are treated as kind of core states. So that kind of makes a little difference in the uh, final result. Uh, other than that, more or less, they are kind of agree with one another. Uh, another thing you can calculate uh, a Hellman Feynman force on molybdenum atoms. Like, for example, have like a, a molybdenum and uh, you, you move the center atom by a little bit, you can test the calculated force. You can compare with like a vast result. Uh, the reason I compare with the vast because vast doesn't have like a poorly uh, 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 correction. It's more accurate than VN2K. So make this direct comparison. And uh, so more or less it's mostly agree with except few points here because uh, 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 there's a kind of uh, 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 radio grid. It's not really, we have to converge the radio grid, I believe that's called little uh, uh, this, uh, uh, difference. I believe we can uh, uh, check further. Um, so I'll ask the, uh, the the person who calculated this uh, about checking the converging of the, the radio grids. Uh, another comparison is a, a quantum, with a quantum espresso. You see, they all kind of agrees quite well with the, uh, 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 the, the this agreement so well because this displacement is about this area because uh, this displacement is about like ball radius up to 0.1, but this is like to 10%. It's about this area. So the, you know, it's not surprising they agree so well. Uh, so this is for the uh, uh, simple metals. How about the, for random alloys? Uh, there's a method based on multiple scattering theory called the KKRCPA method. Uh, our goal is to find uh, for, for, because for random alloy, there are many, many different uh, configurations. So on average, you can find, we hope to find, a, you know, go to find this called effective medium called CPA medium that this, the calculation based on the effective medium represents the computational average result. Okay, the question is, how do we get the CPA medium? The way we do that by taking a single size approximation is we put atom one in here surrounded by effective medium, multiply uh, the, the result, multiply by the content of atom one, plus you put atom B here surrounded by effective medium, you, you, uh, you multiply by the content of atom B, you average it, you're supposed to get this result. So this kind of picture shows kind of self consistency uh, uh, condition to find CPA medium. Uh, okay, so essentially that means that, uh, and the other way to look at it is the Green's function, configuring Green's function should be the average of the Green's function for this problem and for this problem. Uh, in the multiple scattering theory, this kind of impurity problem has exact uh, solution for that. It's given by this expression that, because the tau matrix, as I show you, is a kind of critical in tackling the Green function. Well, T alpha is at A atom or B atom. TCPA is a single scattering uh, 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 T matrix for the CPA medium. So this tall CPA means the, the effective medium like this. This is a periodic structure, except each side is a, is a CPA medium, which can be calculated using k-space integration method, as I showed you before. Of course, our unknown is a TCPA. So by solving this kind of uh, self-consistent uh, condition, we have found the TCPA. Then we'll be able to calculate tau alpha. Uh, this is a matrix that can be used to calculate uh, G alpha, uh, uh, the green function for, for this particular each individual systems. Using that, we can calculate the charge density associated with different atomic species. Okay, so this is kind of procedure uh, we take to approach to uh, 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 to the study random alloy. Uh, so this is one example of the calculating done by uh, uh, Amish, it's a student at the CMU. Uh, he used this uh, this KKR CPA code calculate this uh, hydrogen alloys which is a five or more elements of a multi-component uh, random alloy. So this is a kind of, we can get energy versus the lattice constant. You get the equilibrium lattice constant and compare with the experiment. It's excellent uh, uh, comparison compared to like a, with VASP plus the supercell method. Uh, usually it has uh, shows kind of a smaller lattice constant compared to, uh, 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 lattice, uh, compared to experiment, but rather this uh, KKCPA a re result shows a little bit larger lattice constant, uh, more close to uh, experiment. So this is one of the uh, kind of uh, approach. Remember that this is spin polarized calculation with only one item per unit cell, okay? Instead of like a supercell calculator, you have to do all different 
conf configurations of the big supercell. But this is one atom printer cell calculation. Uh, so the concentration of each uh, atomic element can be you know, arbitrary number. So uh, it's a kind of advantage of KKRCPI method. Uh, the, 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 the criticism of KKRCPM method is basically that it's an in-single type approximation. You don't take into account the show annual ordering effect. So there's a recent work uh, by uh, um, uh, Vishnu and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Widom at uh, uh, CMU that we work together about solving this problem by uh, consider uh, uh, embedded cluster into uh, this effective medium. The, uh, the average neighbor is determined by uh, uh, the this this every neighbor is determined by the showing order effect showing the ordering of uh, depending on the uh, the center atom. Okay, so we can essentially average the the, the T matrix and construct uh, uh, this uh, 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 this uh, cluster. By doing this average, we can get uh, we can get the uh, 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 the green function that which had includes the showing ordering effect. Uh, the way to calculate this kind of cluster embedded in the effective beam, uh, there's a uh, a, 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 a formula to do the calculation. Uh, it's kind of easy to uh, just follow this. It's kind of extension of the single in single impurity problem. This is kind of cluster uh, uh, problem now. That again, uh, tall CPA is calculated using this uh, 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 formula. Then uh, can calculate uh, chi density associated with each different uh, uh, atoms. But now this kind of calculating already in taking into account showing the order effect. Uh, so if you want to know more about this, this is uh, just being Posted online and it's submitted for publication. And uh, a, a recent study, we used this method to look at the showing order effect in uh, um, beta phase of copper zinc. We know at the uh, uh, ground state, a copper zinc is uh, ordered called beta uh, prime phase. Uh, if you increase temperature, it become a, a BCC uh, a disorder phase. Uh, so with, this is a plot of energy versus the showing order parameter that when at, uh, at w equal to zero, it's a complete order, B2 structure, and w equal to 0 0.5 is a complete disorder. So you can plot energy versus the showing of order parameter in, within the, in the framework of this uh, uh, cluster average KKR CPA calculation. You can see the energy changes as a showing order parameter. Obviously, the, uh, uh, with the showing ordering, it has a lower energy. So that's what we would expect, because at, low, at the lower temperature, uh, it is if form, the system forms an um, um, order phase. Uh, we can also look at the density of states that the, uh, the uh, complete disorder structure has these dotted uh, density of states, is a, has a, a kind of broadening of the density of states uh, compared to the uh, P2 phase, which is uh, this uh, solid line. And, uh, but if you reduce uh, showing ordering, if you have this dashed line, is, uh, the density of state become uh, 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 narrowed. Uh, so it's uh, also what we uh, should expect as uh, ordering, uh, showing ordering was in introduced. Okay, the, uh, uh, certainly uh, if you want to do a supercell calculation, uh, you can go beyond a single site uh, then, uh, because this is sometimes it needed that if your system has uh, like a, uh, uh, dislocations and the uh, grand boundaries, sometimes you want to study more complex uh, disorder structures, you want to use a supercell method. Uh, Conventional KKL method has uh, uh, this uh, actually is n cubic problem. So, just Yang, sorry to interrupt. Yang, uh, yes. you are almost finished with your time. Oh, really? Okay. How many Maybe, slides uh, you still have? Okay. Um, you want to skip the introduction for the LSMS? Maybe. Okay. All right. So, basically, uh, this is a linear scaling method that allows to uh, um, uh, perform on, uh, uh, can do tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of atoms. Uh, the, uh, so I have to run a little quickly. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, we have shown the, the performance uh, scalability of the, the, the LSMS method on Summit, and, uh, and both on Titan and Summit. And uh, uh, so it has a kind of great potential to run. Uh, it's being achieved like pit of flop performance and it has great potential to achieve at scale. Uh, so we, I have show some uh, this application of, I'm not going to uh, spend time to talk about it. So with, with uh, this large unit cell calculation and uh, also this kind of calculation shows the uh, 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 machine learning combined with the LSMS calculation because it can run uh, generate all different sizes of supercell uh, energies and uh, they can be combined with a uh, learned uh, 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 framework. 
to study uh, disorder uh, structures. And uh, finally, I want to mention about this effective medium approach to disorders uh, 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 materials that in a conventional aerosmith method we have embedded in the vacuum, but now can actually embed into effective mediums. Uh, in particular, one interesting effect is uh, embedded in the typical uh, medium. So this is a, a medium we found it can be uh, used to uh, uh, capture the Anderson localization effect, uh, 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 transition method, uh, a transition effect that caused by uh, a disorder, uh, metal uh, insulated uh, uh, transition. So like for this uh, uh, calculation we did, uh, did recently using a model calculation that by introduced disorder, the density states in a, in, a near, in, a, in, a, in a in a band gap is going lower because of disorder effect. You, you should expect to see middle and this, uh, insulated uh, transition. So this kind of typical medium will be able to catch it. So that's kind of typical medium will be used for doing the, the so-called LIZ embedding combined with the LZ method. But this is uh, done in the model calculation, but we want to combine with the uh, initial uh, uh, code that we can really apply that to, uh, uh, to real materials. Okay, so I'm gonna, not gonna talk too much about it because I have to, my time is out. Uh, okay, so Finally, I'm going to mention about this must package that is, is a, it's an effort supported by a National Science Foundation that uh, this uh, kind of computational uh, framework includes uh, KKR, KKRCP, and LSMS. We're going to have the DMFT, DCA, and TMT, TCA also involved into this, uh, in this package. So that to, care, to study, to allow those for the study of the quantum materials. And the people involved uh, in this picture, in this uh, uh, we are kind of it's a it's a it's a combination of uh, people from here in the U.S. and some uh, people from uh, uh, in Germany and also this gentleman is from China. Uh, so also have uh, contributors from uh, uh, at CMU and uh, Oak Ridge and uh, people have been uh, working on and to support this effort and they have tested this code and they're using the code for different uh, applications and they have to contribute to the algorithms uh, like I mentioned like uh, uh, Vishnu's work. Okay, so finally, I want to imagine that if you want to really know what's the multiple scaling theory, I have co-ordered this book. You can find it on Amazon. And this is the kind of summary that you can get this code. It's an it's a open source code. Now you can download it um, from GitHub and currently it involves all these uh, capabilities. Uh, certainly this list will be extended further as uh, time goes. Uh, so finally, I'm going to say that I would, we would welcome the collaborators and users to participate in the effort to make the must uh, uh, efficient and robust community code. So I, that's all I want to say. How much time I used? Oh my, okay, sorry. Uh, thank okay. you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the great talk. So the talk now is open for discussion. So for just a silly question, I always wanted to ask this question. There is really no scattering here, right? Uh, there is scattering. What do you mean, no scattering? Like why it's called the multiple? So it's based on the scattering theory, but okay. but there yeah. is no. Go ahead, okay. please. Yes. Uh, multiple scattering. If you consider electrons being, because it's a one electron problem, you treat each the potential around each atom as a single scattering scattering center. So it's a collection of the, all the atoms in the in the, in the solid. So it's a multiple scattering. So electron being scattered by all the atoms. That's why it's called multiple scattering. Okay. Uh, but multiple scattering, this, this approach takes, try to find kind of so-called standing wave approach, a standing wave solution to the multiple scattering problem because there is no actual scattering, right? But it forms kind of standing wave. The solution is we are trying to find that, that forms the block wave. The block wave is actually is a standing wave solution of multiple scattering problem. Okay, okay, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So compared to the standard approach in VASP, what's the strength of this? So obviously the strength, one of the strengths is for doing alloys, right? That's right, yes. So we can avoid the supercell calculations, okay? So it's a okay, very, very efficient. And another thing is uh, it can combine with other, uh, uh, like a DMF, DMFT, uh, DCA, or other uh, 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 methods like that requires local orbitals. It can combine with those things easily. Uh, another thing is we've got of the, uh, this is all electron method. So really, if you like, want to compress uh, uh, structures, sometimes core states really play important role. You want to really work with all electron method, not pseudo potential based method. Okay. okay? 
Okay. Uh, another thing is really this kind of developed into this uh, linear scaling, shows real linear scaling. Uh, so it has potential to do super cells, can go to like thousands or tens of thousands, even more atoms, big unit cell for complex uh, structures. So this also shows another potential that uh, I don't, uh, 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 very, very few other, other methods can, can, do, can do at this point. Okay. Good, thank you, thank you. Sure. In the interest of time, let's move on. Uh, so again, thank you very much for a great talk. Thank you, clapping. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. So the second speaker is Shiwei Zhang. Uh, Shiwei is a senior research scientist and a group leader at the Center for Computational Quantum Physics at the uh, Flatiron uh, Institute. Uh, he is also a chancellor uh, professor at the physics department in College of William and Mary. Shiwei received his PhD from Cornell and then joined the physics department at William and Mary after doing postdoc at Los Alamos and Ohio State. Shiwei is a leading authority on quantum Monte Carlo methods uh, for strongly correlated systems. Uh, he developed many, many approaches, uh, particularly the auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo that has been applied in different fields, including quantum chemistry, condensed matter physics, nuclear physics, uh, cold atoms, and so on. Uh, Shiwei has a long list of honors, including an SF Career Award, Cottrell Scholar Award, and he is a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, on a personal level, uh, I would like to welcome Shiwei. I wanted to welcome him in person uh, last April, but it didn't work out. Uh, so welcome. Uh, he is my previous mentor uh, at uh, William and Mary, as I was I was a postdoc with him and she, uh, with uh, Shui and Henry Kakawer, and uh, I spent three wonderful years there, very productive years, and I will always be in debt in, for a wonderful job that they did. Uh, so uh, Yang told us about DFT and why it's good. Shui is going to tell us why DFT is not good, I guess. So Shui, please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Wissan, for the wonderful, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Jeremy and Ken for the invitation. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, there seems to be so much going on at uh, PQI, really lots of common interests. So I actually kind of struggled a little bit in picking a topic. Uh, I sort of settled on a simple system, the hydrogen chain. Uh, which turns out to be very rich. So hopefully this will provide a uh, starting point for dialogue and uh, discussions. Uh, and uh, no, DFT is not bad. <laughs> okay, good. So um, I wanted to talk about the hydrogen chain. Uh, here's sort of the, uh, you, um, you can see my screen okay, right? Um, can you see the pointer? I I can see the screen and the pointer. Okay, good. So uh, I wanted to uh, remind everybody about the mini electron problem, namely that DFT has been fantastic, but there are problems where uh, we need to uh, treat correlations more explicitly, the challenges and opportunities there. And then I want to tell you briefly about a project that was completed a few years ago, the Simons Collaboration uh, Hydrogen Chain Benchmark Project, which basically determined uh, very much like in DFT, the total energy so uh, equation of state. And then mainly I wanted to move on and tell you about uh, the follow-up project, which uh, determined the phase diagram. Uh, what I meant is, so this is a little cartoon down here of the hydrogen chain. Basically these uh, thick dots or protons that are held fixed, confined on a line, and the little uh, black dots are the uh, associated electrons. And uh, the system, we're interested in the uh, infinite chain limit to mimic a solid really has just one parameter, which is the interparticle spacing R. So as a function of R, it looks awfully simple, but we ask the question, what happens in the ground state? It turns out to be remarkably rich. There is a metal insulator transition we could establish. There's different magnetic correlations. There's very subtle interplay between interaction and uh, uh, band structure effects. So, um, 
um, what happens, this is really just an introduction, you're all very familiar with this, what happens inside of materials computation. So this is the hydrogen chain again, now the protons became yellow or orange. Um, and um, as a function of time, if you visualize these, the protons will move and uh, this is like a movie coming down and the protons trace out these lines. And the electrons would adjust or respond very, very quickly. Um, they're much lighter. And uh, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation basically fixes these nuclear positions and uh, assumes that the electrons respond instantaneously. So uh, here's that picture again, and uh, I've drawn out the electron traces. This is picturing somehow we, if we could take pictures of the ele electrons, we know that they're indistinguishable. I've colored the different individuals just so that you can see that they, you know, in a bonding regime, an electron will hop between different protons and uh, move. So the electron's response is a consequence of a lot of things. It's Fermi statistics which means that when there's an exchange, the red one exchanges with the blue, uh, uh, the wave function, global wave function will have to change sign. Uh, it's a, a function of the environment, the external potentials that the electrons uh, experience from the protons and also the electron-electron interaction. So it's a complicated process that happens. Now precisely how they respond determines many of the materials properties. Uh, for example, the electron density distribution would determine the interatomic uh, potential or force field where you know larger scale materials computations are done with force fields but really the origin of course as we know is quantum mechanicals how this, re this response uh, happens so here's an example uh, of the equation of state uh, just a little cartoon after uh, in a while we're going to actually compute this but the blue line as a function of R uh, maps out uh, the potential. We know it'll have a minimum and at large R limit, it'll be just the sum of individual hydrogen atoms. So per atom, this uh, metric should be a half um, in, in atomic units. So um, you would, based on this equation, determine the equilibrium uh, lattice constant, so to speak, and this energy scale would tell you the cohesive energy, in other words, the energy it takes per particle to break the solid. And um, this parabola would tell you about phonons, the bulk modulus, um, and in other words, how hard the system is and so on and so forth. So the many electron problem, um, if you truly wanted to solve the Schrodinger equation, is uh, has exponential in size of the Hilbert space and it has often large entanglement. In other words, you can't just cut it very simply. Um, as we heard very vividly, very nicely from the previous talk, um, uh, Jan showed us how DFT-based calculations have been the workforce, really tremendous uh, success. A vast majority of the calculations in material science and physics, chemistry, biology uh, have been done this way. Um, we also know that often the properties of the materials are a delicate balance. Um, not always, but very often. So tiny- sure you are breaking up. So, sorry, uh, how is it now? So uh, tiny energy differences can cause um, uh, different states, the system to go into different states. In other words, different phases can be separated by very small energy differences. So for the chemists, um, for example, Ken would be very familiar with this uh, chromium dimer uh, plot of the potential energy curve when you try to break the bond, when you try to pull the two chromium atoms apart, you can see there's an experimental curve, uh, which has this funny structure, the usual uh, dip, but it has this long shoulder and so on. This is the consequence of strong magnetic correlations because uh, chromium has a six fold uh, bond as you try to attach them. But here are some typical theories. Many of you are familiar with these with these acronyms, these are different density functionals. There's Hawk-Tree-Fock, and this is the high level chemistry methods. But you can see that our theories in this case fall uh, quite short. And uh, uh, really to be able to do very predictive ab initial computations uh, is the foundation of these materials genome efforts. If we want to be able to predict large materials, the foundation inside the quantum mechanics has to be accurate and predictive. Of course, as a physicist, we would love to understand or even predict um, uh, properties of such materials. This is the um, cuprate 
family high TC superconductors, um, we couldn't, we can't, uh, even just to describe this plane, which where we believe most of the physics takes place, this copper oxygen plane in a lattice like this, uh, um, as the Hubbard model, so-called Ising model of many body quantum physics, uh, very simple band structure and uh, on-site interaction. Uh, we've, since the discovery of high TC, uh, now 30 some years, uh, we really don't have a complete uh, control over even the solution of a simple Hubbard model. Uh, seemingly simple Hubbard model. So I'm gonna move on to the benchmark project. This is a large project involving many, many authors. Uh, this was published a few years ago. Um, it's to benchmark the hydrogen chain uh, through the Simons collaboration on the many electron problem. Um, and these are the groups, uh, um, um, authors of the paper, many, many different groups, Garnett Chen, uh, Gustavo Scuseria, Andy Millis, uh, Emmanuel Go. Dominica Zied, uh, Steve White, Sandro Sorella, David Supperly, uh, Nikolai Prokofiev, uh, total of 10 groups, 21 authors. Um, so why do this benchmark? Uh, I mentioned to you the many electron problem is a grand challenge, it's hard. Um, there's been lots of developments from different angles. There's been many methods developed, but there's not a single one that's really general and uh, broadly applicable. Uh, so there are different strengths of each method and different domains of applicability. Uh, the, a benchmark would allow us to understand the capabilities and guide decisions in application, would also produce uh, reference data for future developments. So um, a side product, which seems very obvious that we discovered through these benchmark efforts is that uh, then using complementary methods applied synergistically can be a new paradigm to attack some really challenging problems where these different probes or like different experimental probes, STM, uh, neutron, you know, APES and so on. If you all measure the same samples, uh, it's much easier to make, uh, 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 make uh, conclusions. So one good example that uh, I'm very proud of, there is a, a preceding benchmark effort on the Hubbard model that I just uh, drew on the previous page. Uh, and that was a paper uh, published now five years ago uh, and following that, uh, there are four methods that emerged, four of the uh, methods that emerged from the benchmark we used to determine the stripe order in the um, uh, Hubbard model. Uh, these stripe orders are basically anti-photomagnetic uh, orders uh, that have an envelope modulating them. And the wavelength of that can involve up to 10 supercells, uh, 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 unit cells. So very, very large collective modes which obviously uh, make it very challenging to do. You have to treat supercells uh, uh, that are very large. Um, and very recently, we uh, looked at the pure Hubbard model with no next near neighbor hopping, just straight Hubbard model, and to look at uh, uh, the existence of uh, superconducting correlations. And we seem to find that it's not there. So that's this uh, recent uh, preprint. Um, so we used a big array of methods here, different uh, chemistry methods, these acronyms, quantum chemistry methods, some uh, wave function methods that are based on QMC and embedding methods and diagrammatic methods and so on. Um, my own uh, specialty is this acronym AFQMC, auxiliary field quantum on color. And uh, this was sort of done in solids um, in 03. And uh, through years of development, uh, it's sort of maturing into a powerful method for both materials and models. Here's one uh, really a pioneering uh, work um, where um, after the, so the initial that paper I just mentioned really was a solid state calculation using plane waves. And this paper kicked off the application in chemistry using Gaussian basis set you see here that uh, it, it uh, is formulated how one would do a chemistry calculation. And you'll recognize the lead author here is our esteemed uh, chairman, Lu Sun. Uh, so that was really the, the paper that kicked off the chemistry uh, applications. So um, the Hamiltonian, this uh, system, hydrogen system here, uh, we have in the methods that did the benchmark, some that work directly in real space, diffusion Monte Carlo in particular. So this is the Hamiltonian. Uh, we're describing only these little dots, these electrons, these are their kinetic energy, and this is the external potential they feel. 
uh, from the protons. And this is their uh, interaction, which is basically one over R, but subjecting, for example, to periodic binary conditions. And then we have many other methods, including FDMC, that are formulated with a basis. And inside a basis, these are the creation destruction operators. You write this in second quantized form. And many of the methods use this. So the benchmark uh, roadmap did the following. We first did a 10 atom chain. So this is like a molecule. It has a finite length. And we first did the minimal basis. This is a problem you could diagonalize. So you know the exact answer. And then we tried to crank up to the continuum limit where the electrons live in continuum. Uh, continuous space. So that's called the complete basis set limit. And then we increase the size of the chain to go to the thermodynamic limit where the number of atoms in the chain would be infinity. So again, doing a minimal basis, this would be like an extended Hubbard model. And then finally, joint uh, basis continuum limit and the thermodynamic limit, this produces a curve that is that curve uh, of the equation state. So really in this uh, process, we're trying to uh, saddle three different threefold challenge. We first have to uh, for methods that work in uh, basis space. We have to go to the complete basis at limit. We have to go to the infinite chain limit, and then we have to control accuracy to get the actual answer to get here. So uh, many methods I mentioned: meticulous comparisons and cross checks. We made a large set of reference data is here. Uh, published by PRX, but also there's a GitHub that hosts all the data that was produced and considerable amounts of insight uh, about technical needs. And in this process, you know, the it's a friendly sort of uh, rivalry uh, when you do benchmark. Uh, it spurred really a lot of developments within each method. Uh, people invented new approaches within their framework to really compete. And this is a great, uh, great uh, outcome of this. Uh, this is that curve. It's a boring looking curve. Here's, you know, the, uh, basically the curve. And this is a zoom of our final, and with respect to our final answer, we can sort of see how each method performed and so on. So um, I'm gonna move on to talk about the follow-up project, which is in that process of trying to compute the uh, total energy. We found that there's interesting physics that we didn't seem to quite understand. So that's this, uh, uh, next part, which there's a preprint now. So this is the preprint. Uh, again, many, many uh, groups, uh, this time a smaller subset, but these are the authors and there are five groups. Um, uh, and these are the young people within each group uh, uh, that really did uh, the work, drove this uh, project. Um, so, um, I'll give you an overview and then I'll talk about the different regimes. We only have one parameter, which is R, the separation. This is as a function of R. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is this. At large R, we have basically anti-photomagnetic correlation, which uh, is not totally surprising. And then as you press R uh, a little bit, get the atoms to be closer, you see a dimerized phase or phase of tendency for dimerization. And then there's a transition from an insulating state to a metallic state, where inside the metallic state, there's funny uh, magnetic correlations that we're still trying to fully understand. So um, in terms of this um, uh, equation of state that we computed, you can see most of the stuff we did was focusing on this part. Really, the metal insulator transition were barely touching. And when we did, we noticed problems because, for example, with the chemistry methods, when you bring the R's very close, the basis set superposition error becomes huge and to get to the continuum limit becomes very tricky. And it turns out to determine the metallic phase uh, very accurately, that sensitivity uh, played a key role or as was a key obstacle. So what I'm going to do, uh, we have lots of approaches, these five different groups, basically five methods. Um, and uh, this for, has to go beyond total energy to probe correlations to understand the physics. And I'm gonna tell you this way. So I'm gonna start from large R and go down. So at large R, basically the physics is captured very well by a one band Hubbard model at half bidding. In other words, this is the H2 uh, that we're used to thinking about when you pull H2 the molecule apart. Uh, eventually you get a up or down or down or up, right? It's anti-photomagnetic. And this is basically a lot of H when you pull it apart. And you see this sort of a correlation up, down, up, down. And, um, it's a mod insulator, gapless spin excitations. 
But the one subtlety is that this is a measure of the spin correlation at different R. So this is large R. You can see that it goes up, down, up, down, up, down, but the amplitude decays. And similarly, at a somewhat smaller R, R equal two, it still does that. So the spin-spin correlation, if you measure this, you're gonna see nail order. And now what I'm plotting is a log-log plot of this amplitude, absolute value of the spin. And you can see that it falls on a good straight line, which implies a power law decay. So this is not true long range order because it's quasi one dimensional. And at least at large R, it's quasi one dimensional, even though the atoms are of course fully three dimensional. Uh, we fit an exponent, which is 1.11 and contrast that with the Heisenberg model, uh, which has a logarithmic correction, uh, but with coefficient one, uh, with power one. So now you reduce R a little bit. Here's uh, electron density in a segment of four atoms. And you can see the density, you know, there's the density centers around each atom, which is not surprising, but you can see the contour, for example, there's bigger density here than here. And you integrate, you cut through the axis in planes perpendicular to the axis and integrate the density. And this is the curve that you see. By the way, this chain is an open binary condition. If you do a periodic binary condition, you won't see this. You'll have to measure the density density correlation function to see this. So we broke the end to break translational symmetry. So then you can see that it oscillates. It goes the minimum, for example, this is deeper than the next minimum and then deeper again. So if you look at the discrepancy between the alternating sites, you define an order that's dimerization. In other words, these two are trying to dimerize, even though the interatomic spacing is identical. So it's not that it's actually forming the H2 molecule. It's just the electrons are hinting that they want to do this. Um, so if you look at this order and you plot the same thing, you plot this order on a log log plot, you see a power law decay now with a, a, a power uh, 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 about a half. Hey, Ray, no. can, I ask, can I ask a question? Okay. You, you said you wouldn't see this in the infinite system, but isn't the piles instability? Yes. I mean, isn't this a sort of precipitating a piles instability that would survive the infinite system? Yes, that's right. So this, the infinite system, it does survive. The tendency does okay. survive. It would just be okay. a function uh, because it'll be a linear combination of the two, you know, oscillating things. And if you let the atoms move, because right now we're holding the protons, if you let them move, they would actually realize the pyro's instability. Uh, but right now, it's just the density doing this fluctuation to suggest that they wanted to dimerize. So notice that if you did hot refock, depends on whether you do restricted or unrestricted, you either see no order or you see a true long range order, not this quasi, not this power wall decay. And if you did DFT, uh, we did PBE, you see no order. So uh, now moving on to two things. So this part, this portion is well captured by the one band Hubbard model, uh, at least qualitatively. Now I'm gonna tell you about this uh, transition and also inside the metallic phase. So from the, we're coming down from large R where we just concluded that the Hubbard model is a good model. In other words, basically each electron belongs to a site and it hops to the next near neighbor. And then if two electrons are on the same side, it picks up a repulsion. And that's a good picture to picture this hydrogen chain at large atomic separation. If you believe that, model, you would conclude there's no metal insulator transition. The Hubbard model does not have a metal insulator transition. Uh, any finite infinitesimal U would trigger an antiferromagnetic correlation and an insulating phase. Uh, we are going to compute this polarization measure, which is defined with respect to the many body wave function uh, like this. And here's the result of this, the absolute value, because this is a complex object. This is the uh, uh, absolute value. And as a function of R from three different methods, two of these are the accurate Monte Carlo. This one is a variational one that's fed into the diffusion Monte Carlo. And you can see that, uh, um, um, oh, so the theory behind this is that uh, if you have a metallic phase, Z is supposed to be zero in an infinite supercell. If you uh, look at a bulk system, it's supposed to be zero. If you, um, uh, have an insulating phase, it's supposed to be what? So it's just supposed to be a step function. But we see this. And that's because we do a calculation in a large supercell, but not infinite supercell. 
And the finite size gives you this correction. It's trying to be one, but it's a correction. And the correction has to do with how your supercell size compares to the correlation length of the insulating phase. In other words, it's insulating, but the electrons are increasingly more mobile. So uh, we gave, so I'll give you an expl schematic illustration first, give you a way the punchline why it uh, happens, why the metal insulator transition happens, and then we'll look at uh, the actual calculation that actually led us to this uh, picture. So at large R, uh, this is the bottom band. This is the top, the next band. So this is 1S, maybe that's 2S. The 1S is occupied or have occupied, the 2S is not. And you just have an insulating, you have a gap. This is the Fermi level. You have a gap, you have a, a insulating phase. This is where it's in the one band Hubbard model of the gene. As you make R smaller, what happens is the Fermi level crosses this and moves down, crosses the first band and uh, cuts this so that uh, there's band crossings of the Fermi level. So for example, this cuts the first band here and there is an X, this is proportional, this amount is a doping amount. In other words, you're moving some electrons from the bottom band up to the uh, next band. And it also cuts, occupies part of the upper band and that defines another Fermi uh, momentum. If there are only two bands involved in this process, then this Fermiology should hold that the degeneracy of the top band times its K1 plus K2 should be pi over two where G is the degeneracy. So we probe the spin-spin uh, structure factor. This is basically just define a spin. You calculate the spin correlation function and then make a, stru 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 a structure factor. So here's the uh, result. The um, at large R, it's this set of curves where it shows a peak at one, which is pi over R. And that's precisely uh, consistent with what we measured before of this anti ferromagnetic up down, up down correlation. It has a peak at pi, which is a um, um, algebraic, not long range order. The long range order would have well, a larger peak. And this is. Uh, sorry, what's, the, what's the units of R? So R is the, um, uh, it, you mean in this bottom layer, it's atomic unit. Atomic units. Yeah. So um, as you decrease R to 0.9, you get this set of curves and you can see that there are two peaks. Uh, you identify a K1 and a K2. And the Fermiology is such that it would indicate that in this band, there's degeneracy two, um, uh, presumably having to do with the PX and PY uh, composition, uh, Z is along the axis. So um, this, um, 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 a phase diagram I showed you before. Um, there's a couple of uh, points I wanted to make. Um, so the uh, metal insulator transition, uh, uh, Mott started uh, looking at it as many of you are probably familiar with uh, the name Mott insulator. And Mott started worrying about this, I think in the fifties, in fact, uh, he proposed a mechanism which is basically one of exciton binding. He says that if, uh, so, he considered precisely an array of hydrogen atoms uh, where, you know, if you come in from the insulating side, each electron is bound to one proton, one atom. And um, in order to, uh, so it can form an excitation uh, of an electron hole excitation, but the electron hole would be bound through a one over R interaction and would be bound. So it can't leave its parent site and that uh, uh, sustains it in an insulating phase. So in order for the transition to happen, Mark argued that there would have to be global screening so that this neutral, this one of our binding is wiped out so that the electrons escape free. So he argued that it would be a first order transition because of this. What we seem to find is that it's not quite this exciton uh, because you notice that the excitation, uh, when you dope the band, it goes up to a very different K value. Uh, it's a self doping mechanism that's a consequence, a combination of the Mott correlation and the band structure. And it seems to be second order. And the second order conclusion is from that Z that goes uh, systematically up continuously. And that's a correlation uh, changing. So uh, uh, 
a more subtle, more nuanced sort of picture than that. Uh, Marx's theory of metal insulator transition would suggest, who was really the pioneer in, in, in thinking about these. Inside the metallic phase, here's an example of the density or spin density that I'm showing. So how you, a physical picture to think about this is roughly this size here, the inside uh, these little bright dots are the protons. And the 1s electrons would be sort of like the inside cloud. So that's the, the uh, chain before uh, the metal insular tra transition happened. In other words, before it turned into a, in a metallic phase, the electrons are tightly bound to all the protons. But as soon as um, the uh, metallic phase kicks in, some electrons escape this binding, kicks into a second band, which is much wider in physical space, right? It's a P orbital or some strange combination of P and S orbital that is very diffuse in the plane perpendicular to the chain. So you get this very loose, this, this is like one electron cloud, that's another electron. These are different spins. So you get these very dilute set of electrons that have been kicked off into the upper bands that are still bound, but very loosely to the wire, which is like wrapped, right? The electrons, the inside electrons screen the protons so that the binding is very weak. So you have this kind of an electron wire picture and inside, outside here, these electrons, because it's so low in density and there's barely any screening, you get these long range interactions and you know what happens to electron gas at uh, really low density, right? All kinds of strong correlation kicks in. So we seem to see magnetic correlations in here that are consequences of these electrons. And the Precise nature of the correlation is sensitive to calculation of details. We have these different methods and treat different supercell sizes. Exactly what band they occupy seem to change. So that's still a subtlety, uh, a question that we should uh, uh, continue to investigate. So um, experimentally, how might one realize these? Well, um, um, uh, recall that there's lots of um, experimental ac activities in uh, high pressure hydrogen terms of uh, studying uh, uh, metallic behaviors and superconducting behaviors and so on. Uh, this perhaps could uh, complement or enhance that uh, interest. Uh, but uh, realizing this chain, for example, cold atoms in optical lattices might be a possibility or arrays of these Rydberg atoms uh, or the wonderful things they could do with Rydberg atoms. And uh, carbon nanotubes, so carbon chains have been isolated already in a carbon nanotube. So this is a hydrogen sort of equivalent of that. Of course, one could also, we could also go study the hydrogen or the carbon chain. But it seems like these are really uh, rich systems that are simple for uh, uh, really rigorous uh, treatment. So uh, I'm not sure how much time I used. Um, um, how much time do I have? You still have a couple of minutes. Oh, okay, good. So, um, uh, let me then just summarize this, and maybe if I have a couple of minutes, I'll tell you about my other interests. I told you about my conflict in picking a topic. I'll tell you uh, in one minute what other things I do so we can discuss and chat. So let me summarize this part first. I told you about this benchmark uh, project, which is a comprehensive benchmark, stu uh, benchmark study of the hydrogen chain. We deployed a large array of cutting edge mini body methods. We obtained the equation of state uh, computed to really hot rate accuracy. Um, we then uh, did a, a, an investigation of the ground state phase diagram of the hydrogen chain by again, a multi-messenger uh, approach. Uh, the physics there seems to be surprisingly rich. Uh, and we think that the hydrogen chain can serve as an important model system uh, in, in our field. And this is in this um, uh, preprint. Um, and I want to remark uh, that this is really, uh, I think, an exciting and, and, and a really different time uh, uh, turning point sort of for computational quantum physics with methodological advances, a lot of effort invested in uh, developing methods, and, and collaboration. This is a new thing. And these um, benchmark sort of uh, efforts really, I think, change the outlook of how we do these set standards and uh, uh, really contributed to this, which some of which we didn't quite anticipate. Of course, there are other benchmark efforts as well, but embarking on this, one didn't anticipate some of the 
additional positive impacts. And of course, as uh, Yang uh, illustrated very nicely, big computers, these are keys. And uh, that's the Flatiron Institute. This is New York City. So, uh, oh, sorry. So um, if I still have a couple minutes, I'll just tell you uh, very quickly about some other things I, I worry about, I think about. So the, uh, this is now my, so the work I've told you about is, you know, uh, collaborations involving many, many um, outstanding groups. Uh, this is not talking about my group's activity. Uh, so we basically, we're a computational uh, quantum physics group. We work on methods. We design new uh, capabilities, uh, for example, geometry optimization in terms of electronic structure, computing forces, dealing with spin orbit coupling, electron phonons, and so on. That's, those are the recent interests, current interests. Uh, we improve our instrument, which is this method. We, uh, but in details of the method, for example, how to do better basis sets, faster sam Monte Carlo sampling, which refers to reduce uh, scaling with system size and so on, how to better interface with DFT packages, interface with uh, DFT calculations. And we worry about fundamental theories of these computational methods. This is all under method development. We worry about the sign problem a lot, probably spent um, uh, unwise amounts of my uh, research life worrying about this excited states, dynamics, and so on. And uh, now at the Flatiron, we're also trying to uh, develop softwares, which is much harder to do as an individual research group. But here uh, we have the resources to now try to make these softwares more available to a broader community. So with these methods, then we worry about my interest. We have different, sort of three different uh, categories. I worry about lattice models like the Hubbard model. So this is showing a spin orbit coupling in optical lattices. Momentum distribution, you can see the two different momentum distribution because of spin orbit coupling and how the uh, polarized part in an optical lattice. And this is uh, a Fermi gas, uh, BEC, BCS crossover, how the um, spectral function evolves. Uh, these are also drawn from publications. I worry about ab initio electronic structure. The hydrogen thing is one example of this. But this is an example of COBOL, a simulation of COBOL dropped onto a graphene sheet. Uh, the equation of state for that, where we actually did embedding of uh, QMC inside a DFT calculation to treat this hot spot. And these are 2D uh, solids. And quantum chemistry, uh, I mentioned we sounds effort. And uh, this is the chromium. I mentioned the chromium. We were ac actually able to treat this uh, very well. This red curve here is the uh, calculation uh, um, outcome compared to the experimental curve, which is now the dashed line up there. Um, and these are the regions of magnetic correlations. Uh, there's some disagreement, but recently there's another work from uh, Cyrus Omergaard's group, which seemed to fall very close with the theory, with our ca calculations as well. So perhaps this is worthwhile uh, taking a second look at the experimental curve. And this I'm very proud of. This is in collaboration with the Columbia, a group of uh, Reichman and David Reichman and Rich Frisner. Uh, and experimental group where we actually made a prediction of an up conversion. Uh, and it's actually a genuine prediction. We did this calculation, uh, predicted that uh, the, the reaction would happen. And this little jar is the experimental evidence that it did happen. Uh, you shine a light uh, in there and a different color shows up. Uh, up conversion happened. So uh, with that, let me stop. Thank you very much. And, um, I'd be happy to discuss and take questions. Thank you, Shui. Thank you, Shui, for a wonderful talk. Uh, it's now open for questions. Yeah, I just have a quick question. In the hydrogen chains, were you doing AFQMC with plane waves, or were these all Gaussian basis sets? They were all Gaussian basis sets. Uh, I alluded to the difficulty at small r, mm -hmm. where we did the Gaussian basis sets in the equation of state calculation, the benchmark. Um, um, it turns out we were, so we, I, I claimed, I told you, I boasted that we reached a million Hartree uh, accuracy. Uh, it turns out there's a tiny uh, basis set superposition error that may actually make it outside one million Hartree. So we discovered that when we started studying the metallic phase, so there's one point there, uh, studying the uh, metallic phase more carefully. So what we did with the FQMC is actually to use yet another basis. We engineer the basis. This is what I was alluding to about basis set uh, construction. Uh, 
So what we did is we did a plane wave DFT calculation in a big supercell with different K points uh, because it's metallic. And then we took the cone chain orbitals, the occupied ones, obviously, and all the virtual ones. Um, well, not all the virtual ones, a lot of the virtual ones. And then we cut. We used that as a basis. We wrote out the uh, many body Hamiltonian in that basis set. And then we fed it into this pretend Gaussian uh, code, which got tripped, right? Which read in VIJKL and thought it was dealing with the Gaussian basis set, but it's actually just generated from Cauchy orbitals. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an added complication, which is in the chain, if you do Cauchy calculation of a big box, right? You, the plane waves, you would make a supercell that's uh, long along the chain, you know, wide, you have enough of a vacuum. Uh, but if you do that, most of the virtual orbitals are actually uh, not bound. Only if the occupied orbitals are bound, but the virtual orbitals very quickly, they're not bound. So if you use those as a basis set, it would be a terrible basis set because it keeps, you know, it's diffuse functions that just drift off to infinity. So we did another engineering thing to uh, use the electron density to combine to make a modified Kongshan equation after we've done a uh, DFT, we add an external potential to combine it in the plane and then solve for the eigenvectors again, use those as the basis set. Um, and so that's what we did. Uh, you, you, that's a much longer, I bet you, uh, answer than you bargained for. But that, that no, that's interesting. Thank you. Uh, so how did you check that this potential you added Oh, like along the vacuum direction isn't making a huge difference in uh, the overall energy. Right. So yeah, so we, we try it. I mean, it's a conserve, you make a potential that's wider, right? If the, if the basis set uh, go out a little bit, you, you raised it a little bit, but you don't have a problem. And of course, when we compute the many body uh, density, we come back and look at it and see that the density isn't trying to like push out further right, than what we gave it. So it's a self, there's a self-consistency there that uh, you could do to check the, the you know, finding the basis of the Okay, thanks. Other questions? Ken, we don't hear you. No. So Shira, on the hydrogen chain problem, mm -hmm. has anyone thought about extending this to two different distances, R1 and R2? for alternating hydrogens? Yeah, uh, I'm sure there have been people who, uh, yeah, you're interested in the- um, yeah, In so that's yeah, the instability, right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm not aware of any work that's been done. I think the interest clearly is there. Uh, we, so I think in this group that did the recent work, people probably just need to regroup. Uh, that's a drawn- mm -hmm. As you see that uh, the paper, the first paper was published in 2017. This took us another two years to complete. Uh, so because the phase diagram could be richer mm -hmm. in that two dimensional space. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's a very interesting, uh, very interesting. Other questions, other comments? So, sure. so uh, since Go ahead, is it a, I was going to make a comment, we did some work on the small hydrogen four system a while ago, and we tried to extend that to lithium four, but it turns because the small two s two p gap that is a phenomenally difficult problem. Yeah, but the alkali chain problem is just a lot lot harder than the hydrogen problem. So I, I, I imagine you've thought about that though, right? Yeah, so the, right, so the, um, there are different regimes where it is very delicate. Uh, mm -hmm. part of what we're seeing with the um, magnetic correlations inside the metallic phase is I think a reflection of that exactly. So if you want to stick to this band structure, mm -hmm. right. of course, well, I, I, I use this cartoon to say it's a band structure uh, picture, but I didn't define for you precisely what we mean because these are many body calculations. What do we really mean by a band structure? Uh, what we meant 
in the many body context, how we probe that was to uh, compute the density matrix, one body density matrix, and then diagonalize it to look at the occupancy and the natural orbitals and so on, and sort of think of that as a band. Um, and so apparently what comes in next, there is the bottom band and then the next one, I said that the fermiology was consistent with maybe two, but exactly what the nature of that band is, is tricky. And I think that's a, a reflection of what you're pointing to, Kim, um, that they just, they come, they become very close in, in energy. And uh, the many body calculation, depending on, and some of it is not the computational method, but really the physical system, depending on the supercell size, there's different commensurate um, um, points and so on. So the system is just very sensitive. It reacts to that and picks the ground state for that Hamiltonian, which may be still varying, even if you're treating a very large supercell, it still hasn't saturated at the uh, thermodynamic limit. You know, we were treating something like 40 atoms in a supercell, but that's only like a few, a couple would get excited over a couple of electrons, a few electrons would get excited over the top band. So there's a lot of sensitivity. Shui, just one quick question related to, you mentioned superconductivity in the Hubbard model. It does not exist, you found out recently? So that's a careful, of course, that's a problem that many, many researchers have invested tremendous amounts of time. So it's a very sort of delicate thing. The precise statement is that we looked at the Hubbard model um, as just T, what I wrote down, T, the near neighbor hopping and an onsite U at about uh, the doping where, so if you assume this is the right model for the copper oxygen plane, then the doping you would be interested in would be somewhere, you know, 20, uh, between 10 and 20%, something like that. We looked at this range. We looked at a couple of U over T values, like eight, which are what you would assume to be sensible U's if this model represents uh, the system well. And in that range, we don't find long-range pairing. We find tendency for D-wave, but we don't find uh, um, a long-range order in the D-wave pairing. Now, there's other work at very low U, uh, more controlled method that show that, you know, if a small U, there might be uh, pairing and so on. So our statement is that um, as a model, for cooperates, the pure, this what we call the pure model to distinguish it from, for example, you can imagine T and then a T prime, right. which has been advocated for being important uh, to change the Van Hope singularity and better describe the band structure. Um, so our conclusion was on the TU pure Hubbard model in the regime where it might relate to um, high TC, we didn't find pairing. And there's ongoing effort now to look at T prime and so on to broaden the search. Thank you. Okay, with this, uh, we are over the time limit. Thank you very much, Shuei, for a great talk and for touching on several topics. Uh, let me close the session. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Back to you. Okay, well, bye bye, everyone. Then. Okay, thank you, everyone, and stay bye. safe. Mm -hmm.